thank you all for your patience as we took a quick break, and I will turn it over to the commissioner to tee up our last agenda item. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Um, we um, have arrived at the part of the agenda where we're looking forward to sharing with you sort of program updates <coughs> on the Commonwealth Cares for Children program, and I'm happy to have invited Jocelyn Down, uh, Amy Checkaway, and Adrian Murphy here to present. Um, we have spent much of the last year <laughs> talking about C3, um, understanding the data that we've received from programs, partnering um, with our stakeholders in the community to understand um, how the program impact. Um, as you all are aware, late in the, in the fiscal year last year, we had to implement some um, budget reductions and adjustments to be able to live within appropriation. We've met with our legislative partners talking about Commonwealth Cares for Children. We have dug deep into the data that we've collected from programs, and we are grateful for the ongoing <laughs> contributions from programs in, in, in submitting that data, which has really informed our system. Um, and we have spent a lot of time over the last year thinking about how, mo how most effectively to transition this program into operational grants that, that are sustainable going forward, that um, capitalize on the best of what this program has been able to, cap to, to do. Uh, we know we have returned to pre-pandemic capacity levels. We have made investments in staff salaries, in quality and programs, in behavioral supports. Some of you who were at a C3 event last week were able to see some of those investments happening at the program level. Much of those things have been able to happen without costs being hand passed along to families. Um, and then we've also um, been in a sort of exploratory mode about how do we make sure this program is sustainable in the longer term? How do we make sure that we're directing the resources most effectively to the programs and the families and the communities that need it the most and need that most the most support from us? How do we make sure that we're really tying it to workforce and investments in our workforce? How are we understanding its impact on affordability? Um, so we've been on a journey over the last year and sort of thinking about the future state of this program and we are at a very important inflection point thinking about what what we do going forward into FY25. The final budget um, included both inside and outside as I mentioned um, language around the program expectations for this fiscal year as well as uh, expectations sort of looking into 26 and beyond so um, the team is here to present to all of you sort of our current thinking and approach to the program in FY25, which leans into all of those things I just mentioned. The learnings we've had, the data, uh, the requirements and compliance that are required through, through the budget, um, both inside and outside sections. And I've been saying it's sort of like threading seven different needles at the same time. And um, the team has done a pretty amazing job best to make the different parts um, of our goals and requirements work together um, and to create a greater level of sort of predictability um, and consistency for programs and for and for the agency so I'm really happy to turn it over to the team to share what is a, a, a whole team of, um, of folks who've worked at the agency on sort of where we where we go with um, c3 in FY25 Jocelyn Thank you, Commissioner uh, Secretary board chair and board uh, very happy to be here. I'm going to turn it over to Amy to start and um, with a review of where we've been, and then we will jump into discussing where we're going in this year. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, happy September, everyone. Um, happy to uh, be here today. And I think although uh, most of today is going to be about looking to the future, um, I we think it's really important to continue to um, reflect on the fact um, this, that the Commonwealth Cares for Children program has been such a critical support to um, over 8,000 programs across Massachusetts since its inception. I think looking at our, the agency's strategic objectives and priorities um, over the past year and moving forward, uh, C3 really is such a critical um, lever um, really across all of our strategic priorities. So really helping to stabilize programs, um, provide financial stability, um, the enormous support that is provided to the workforce um, in terms of um, allowing programs to uh, better recruit and retain and compensate and um, support our, our staff. Um, really providing um, a, a lever to um, increase um, access to affordable care um, through programs having the resources to be able to 
um, mitigate tuition increases um, and sustaining and, and starting to build um, higher quality of services um, and education for families with young children. Um, so um, as has already been said, Massachusetts is really uh, seen as a national leader in terms of its um, ongoing investment um, um, through through the budget and beyond and codifying a, a funding stream such as C3. Um, so um, we want to continue to keep in mind everything that we have learned. And I think um, because uh, we are aware and heard, I think, over across all of the listening sessions this summer how important C3 is to the programs who benefit from it, um, using what we've learned to make some improvements um, and think about the future, but recognizing um, the extent to which programs uh, depend on these um, supports um, to uh, remain um, open as well. So um, I think we, I'm not going to be sharing a lot of data slides uh, with you today, um, but you know, as um, uh, board member, non new board members, and maybe even new board members have seen, um, we have seen in our data um, really strong evidence of the positive effects of C3 in terms of um, really allowing uh, the system to grow um, and expand um, in terms of the number of programs, the number of seats um, over, over the last few years, um, as well as seeing educator compensation continue to grow, although we still know there's room for improvement there. Um, and again, um, really, uh, hearing th through our surveys um, and through listening sessions um, how programs have been using this to also um, maintain affordability for the families that are served. And so um, a lot of the forward-looking work um, is, is using the data that we have, um, and uh, we look forward to continuing to track um, the sort of implementation and effects um, of, of C3 over time so that we can adjust as needed. So I'm going to pass it to Jocelyn and Adrian to, to talk through goals um, for moving forward, um, as well as some of the details and timeline. Thank you. Um, so the rest of the presentation is really um, a slight revision to the presentation that we shared back in June. Um, I think I will just say it has been a pleasure to work on C3 this year. This is the most complicated program that I have been involved in from the perspective of the level of coordination with the secretary and the secretary's office governor and the governor's office, the legislature. And I'm really pleased that we are here with the same goals that we started with through this process. Um, we recognize that C3 is a critical funding mechanism for this field. I think the budget process has recognized that. We have the program is written into statute. Um, and on top of that, and I'll get into some of the details in a few minutes, um, it's clear the legislature is looking for permanent funding sources to assign to this program. So there's a lot of good work being done to think about how this is recognized and supported. Um, we are also in a position to maintain universal access to C3, which is really important to the agency. We recognize that this is important for all programs and their capacity to serve families and ensure that child care is accessible and affordable for all families in Massachusetts. And then also recognize it's also important to look at the equitability of the distributions that we're providing and think about in the ways in which we can use this opportunity and use all the cost work that we've done over the last few years to adjust the structure of the funding formula um, to better align with the costs that we understand programs have as well as enrollment. Um, so we are, we have, we're going to dig in a little bit in a few minutes in terms of how we've restructured the base rate um, in the funding formula. And we also want to make sure that we're directing additional funding to programs that are serving um, large numbers of low and middle income families. So we've also taken a look at the equity adjustment and are integrating the tiered structure that we used most recently with the equi original equity adjustment we have. And we'll talk about the details of um, how that's been structured as well. And finally, this past year has taught us that funding predictability is really important. It's important for EEC. It's important for the field. And so we are now looking at an approach whereby by we set the funding amount that a program will receive with a formula, but then keep that funding amount the same throughout the rest of the fiscal year. So everybody knows how much to expect from month to month. Payments don't fluctuate, and EEC understands um, how much we're obligated to the field, and there's planning around that as well. Um, so looking at what we have in the budget, um, Commissioner has spoken about this a little bit. It is complicated. It, <laughs> it covers a few budget lines and quite a bit of, of budget language, both in the inside and outside sections. Um, on the funding side, we are level funded at $475 million, which we're, we're very pleased to announce. And that funding covers two different lines on our budget and three different funding sources. 
So in the um, 3,000, 1,045 line, there is 300 million, and this comes from both the EEC Affordability Fund, which has been a fund that was put together during the pandemic that has been sustaining C3, as well as the new iLottery Fund that has been set up um, to direct funds from that new program to C3. Uh, and then we are also recognizing the fair share line as well, and that's another 175 million there. Um, both of those are particularly important funding sources to think about um, and funding sources that are, in, at least on the fair share, fair, share, fair share side, in part allocated to C3 and for I lottery, I think that is currently, am I right? Hold well, the I lottery is not quite operational yet, but so the, I think the intention is for <laughs> I lottery revenues to be used for this as well, yep. along with, with potentially other things. But so we'll, we will see how that we'll evolves. See how that plays but I, yeah. I, I would say that there is a commitment um, from you know both the legislature and the governor's office to make sure this program is funded at $475 million for this fiscal year. And the final budget included these three funding sources. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the budget language side, uh, there are two lines in the outside section that are um, outside sections that are particularly important for C3. One defines the program in the long term, and the other one focuses in on what we have to do in FY25. So in FY25, we are required to revisit the funding formula and include enrollment considerations in the funding in the way we structure the funding. We also have um, percentages that you can see here on the slide that we're required to expend on programs serving different um, percentages of their license capacity with children receiving child care financial assistance and um, other low-income children or Head Start children. Um, this roughly reflects the tiers that we have been using in May and June and the percentages of funding that were allocated to those tiers in May and June. Um, so this is something that we have been keeping in mind and thinking about how we're restructuring the equity adjustment. We don't follow this completely. We, we make some additions to this as well, which we'll talk about. Um, but this is something that we do also have to track in thinking about um, how the formula is functioning and how money is flowing based on the design of the formula. There is also a requirement that we cap all annual, annual funding for um, any for-profit provider that serves more than 10, has more than 10 programs operating in the state. And those providers as a whole cannot receive more than 1% of our um, C3 funding. Um, the commissioner does, is authorized to consider waivers on that, and so we are in the process of reviewing and determining how we will implement that particular requirement. And then looking ahead, um, there are also a number of requirements around um, FY26 and where this program is going that we are also taking into account and um, implementing as much as we can to be in alignment with where the program is going. We have also are adding some questions to the survey to sort of prepare ourselves for some of those requirements. For example, there will be an expectation in FY26 that um, programs need to be willing to accept a child. If a child comes to them with, a, with eligibility for a voucher, or contracted slot programs have to be willing to accept that child if they take C3 funding. So we're going to ask that question in the survey this year and understand um, where programs stand on that particular requirement that does not come into play until FY26. Also in FY26, um, changes to the formula will come before the board for a vote. No, yes, that's that right. That's not an FY25 yeah. requirement, but just for board's information that um, going forward, that will be something that comes to the board. Um, so this is the structure of the formula. You, you did see this in the spring. Um, this really hasn't changed, but I just, I want to sort of spend a little time reviewing the overall structure and then I'll turn it to uh, Adrian to dig into the details of how this plays out. Um, this continues to be a per slot payment. So in the past, we had the base rate multiplied by a staffing adjustment multiplied by a program's license capacity. We've consolidated the base rate, so there is no longer a separate staffing adjustment in our base rate, and we'll speak to the details about that. But we've used the cost models to create a consolidated base rate um, based on a number of different program characteristics. That is then multiplied by the program's license capacity, except there is now an adjustment for enrollment. So if programs are um, not fully enrolled, the um, payment is prorated based on actual enrollment. Um, but this, I think just to be clear, we are not paying per child enrolled, and that enrollment will be based on an, uh, average, an, um, an average across the past year 
of enrollment. Um, and then on the equity, for the equity adjustment, we have, as I mentioned, consolidated the characteristics that were recognized in the equity adjustment that has been in place with the tiering structure that you saw in the prior slide to create a new set of equity tiers, and we will talk about that in a minute as well. Um, just to give a little bit more information before Adrian goes into the details of how we structured the base rates, we used the cost models and particularly took a look at the recommended staffing and salaries that were built into those cost models to understand um, for a number of different program types uh, how the costs varied from program type to program type and to create an integrated uh, base rate that integrates the base payment and the staffing adjustment expected by that model. Um, for these different types. So we now have a different rate for part-time and full-time programs. On the center-based side, um, the rates are based on the youngest group enrolled because the ages that the program serve really significantly impact the staffing that the program has to have, which then also is the, the most prominent cost driver for programs. For family child care programs, because of some of the sort of restrictions that are in place in the licensing regulations, as well as just the variety of program, the ways programs organize themselves, um, it is actually the staffing itself that is the most important cost driver. So rather than basing it on the age group, we base it on the staffing. And this is actually very similar to what FCCs have currently been doing. The reporting will still continue to be reporting on whether you have an assistant and how many hours the assistant works. And then we'll, we'll break that down into a part-time or full-time, which right now is the 0.5 or the one FTE adjustment that programs have experienced. Great. Great. Thanks, Jocelyn. So I'll walk through, there's a lot going on on this slide, but I'll walk through the new formula and talk through from left to right the, the sort of structure and the details of how we'll calculate programs uh, C3 um, amount. So sort of first at the high level, as Jocelyn just said, this has a very similar structure to the current formula and that it starts with license capacity, uh, a base rate, and an equity adjustment, and we'll all walk through each of those components um, respectively. So if we start on the left, in the, in the gray is license capacity. Just like the current formula, the, the new formula will be rooted in a program's license capacity, um, or the number, of, the number of children that a program is licensed to serve. On the center-based side, we use the program's license capacity here. And for family child care programs, we use a license capacity of 10 for all family child care programs. That mirrors the current formula and the way that current formula works and also treats sort of all FCCs similarly. Uh, what's distinct here, as Jocelyn mentioned, and what's, what will be new in the new formula moving forward is that we then adjust the license capacity based on program enrollment, which is responsive, um, as Jocelyn said, to the budget language. Um, in calculating enrollment here, we're using a 12-month historical look back that buffers programs against fluctuations in enrollment. Um, and for center-based programs, center-based programs with an average enrollment over the past 12 months of more than 75% will receive the full grant amount. And if program's average enrollment over the last 12 months is less than 75%, then their grant amount will be prorated accordingly. Uh, for family child care providers, um, we look not at the percent of enrollment, but the, the number of children enrolled. So, so family child care programs that have enrolled on average over the past 12 months at least three children per month will receive the full grant amount. And then family child care providers whose average enrollment over the past 12 months is less than, than three children will receive their, will have their grant amounts adjusted accordingly. And, and that will still be based on the license capacity of 10 for all yeah. family child care. I think that the, the fact, treating family child care consistently has been an important um, value that we have heard from the field and something that we are going to sustain and continue on both the enrollment calculations as well as the per slot calculations. Yeah, yeah. thanks Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. Um, so next, moving from the gray to the blue section here, um, the program's license capacity is then multiplied by a base rate, which, as Jocelyn noted, is determined by the key cost drivers for programs. So on the center base side, that's the youngest age group that a program serves, um, and for family child care providers, whether they an employ an assistant. And then the base rate is further differentiated uh, for part-time programs. 
So in their C3 applications, programs will report the number of children um, enrolled by age group, which will be used to determine the youngest age group that a program serves, and then we'll assign um, base rates on the center-based side accordingly. So for example, if a center serves um, infants, they'll receive the $100 base rate for infants for all children in the, in, in the program for their, for their full license capacity. Um, in the case of family child care programs, the base rates are assigned based on whether a family child care provider employs a full-time assistant, a part-time assistant, or does not um, employ an assistant. Um, and then in both cases, the base rates are adjusted for programs that operate part-time, as you can see here, um, with the exception of school-age programs. And I think one other thing I want to call out, one thing that we did hear from many school-age programs that we spoke to is, like, a part-time, full-time distinction for a school-age program is very challenging. That you really do need full-time staff, at least in some instances, to run the program. Um, and children's schedules are also very, very complicated in school age. So trying to distinguish between part-time and full-time children. So we have just we will look at the school age program as a whole program. We're not distinguishing between part-time and full-time on either the, the programmatic side nor the enrollment side. Um, and then finally, in, in the gold section here, a program's license capacity and their base rate are then multiplied by an equity adjustment, which is designed to account for the population that a program serves. So programs that are in tier one, which include programs that fill at least 25% of their license capacity with children receiving EEC child care financial assistance, as well as programs that are Head Start programs or are located in a very low opportunity area according to the Child Opportunity Index um, are in Tier 1 and will have their grant amounts um, multiplied by 3. Um, a note here that we'll continue as we currently do using the highest um, percent of children receiving CCFA over the past year, again, to buffer programs from fluctuations um, in, in child care financial assistance enrollment. Um, and, and as a note, also, there's a slide in the appendix with many more details about the Child Opportunity Index. Um, so you can see more about how that um, index is created. It's a, it's a composite measure. Um, then in tier two, programs that serve at least one child with child care financial assistance, but that fill less than a, a quarter of their license capacity with children receiving child care financial assistance, um, as well as programs that providers that provide a substantial number of non-CCFA scholarships. Um, which we define here as scholarships that cover at least 50% of tuition. Programs that provide those scholarships for at least 25% of their children will be in tier two, and those programs will have their grant amounts multiplied by 2.5. Um, Adrian, do you mind if I just yeah. jump in for a second? So I just want to explain that for a minute. We, we heard that the tiers that, that we implemented in the spring relied heavily on just EEC's child care financial assistance. and. Um, two pieces of important sort of context and information in working with our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. One is with the current sort of uh, restrictions on the availability of child care financial assistance. We have many providers who are eager to take our kids and are signing voucher agreements, but we're not able to issue additional vouchers now so that they could move among, move among tiers. Um, although it was working <laughs> to incentivize participation, which is awesome. Um, and then the second thing is that there's a lot of private either fundraising or private scholarship going on at the programs themselves, where they are reducing the costs for families, um, having their own sliding fee scale for families, um, potentially making it free for staff or at a serious reduction of staff. And programs talk to us about recognizing their efforts to subsidize families, whether even if they couldn't get through, even if they couldn't get through our child care financial assistance or off the waiting list, that there are things that programs are doing themselves to subsidize. Mm -hmm. So I would say this is a working edge. We wanted to respond to that. We think it's really important that we're recognizing that affordability and, and even incentivizing that as, an, as, as a way to get more affordability for families, um, especially with limited access to vouchers. Um, so, but it's new for us. So trying to determine exactly what that means and how we would document it will be something that we'll, we'll be working closely with, with programs this, this year, so. Yeah. Um, and then I think another note there that um, this will uh, require additional data collection as part of the C3 um, application process. So 
um, providers will be asked to report the number of children receiving uh, tuition discounts that cover at least 50% of tuition um, and upload documentation accordingly in the application and Some process. people do it informally, some people do yeah. it formally, but in order for us to really tie funding to it, we have to have a way to document it, it's formal. Yep. So it'll, it'll be something we'll be working with programs with over the, over the years to sort out. Um, I think the, the last bucket is just the providers who are in Tier 3. Those are programs that do not serve children with EEC, child care financial assistance, and have not in the past year, um, do not provide um, non-CCFA scholarships that cover at least 50% of tuition to um, at least 25% of children. And those that are not in a, a very low opportunity area, those programs are in Tier 3 and, and don't receive an additional um, equity adjustment. Um, also in that tier are programs that have a CEO to educator wa wage compensation, and we call it the CEO compensation ratio of at least uh, that of at least 30 to 1. Um, those programs are assigned to tier 3, regardless of their location or CCFA participation or other financial supports provided to families. So, yeah. And that's, that's um, analogous to something that has already been happening. in place. Yeah. Great. So happy to take questions. Um, about the formula. The lowest salary for an educator? Yep. Yeah. 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 I have a quick um, comment to consider uh, on the formula, which is a, kind of a blanket formula, but it actually, um, I'm also thinking about school age programs because they are pretty special in many different ways. And they have a different, um, they have a lot of them, or most of them, I don't know if most of them, many of them have collaborations with districts. Mm -hmm. And um, I know at, at, least, uh, at least three or four of them that um, are located in district schools, which is very convenient for families. Um, but the licensing capacity is usually much higher than the actual enrollment because they need to allow for, in our case, I'm just gonna use Lawrence as an example, like when, when there's a snow day or when, or when there's summer months camps, mm -hmm they merge buildings so that they can work on maintenance or, you know, like the school can do whatever they need to do with their buildings and we can still serve families that need childcare and enrichment programming. So they purposely license programs at a much higher level to allow for those merges without having to call the license or every time to change that license number. Mm -hmm. um, so there's different practices across the state. Um, that varies the number of licensing capacity, the, the licensing capacity for programs. And I think a, a, achieving that 75% enrollment is gonna be really difficult for some of those buildings because sometimes there's three or four buildings merge into one and that's where that license capacity is for. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so high. So yeah. just, I think then there needs to be looked at in terms of the formula to accommodate for those. It, it's on the spirit of collaboration with the district, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. No, we can, we can take that back and think about it. I will say the other thing that um, is important to note here, um, I will get into the timeline on all of this. There will be a stage process of rolling this out where people start by getting some information about how the formula works and then we, we implement the final um, version. Um, the administrative review process that we currently have will continue. So there will be an option for programs if they feel like there is something very wrong with how the formula is working to submit a request for an administrative review and we will engage directly on the specifics of a particular program's case. Um, That's that great. Does in that, in, continue. Mar sorry, Maria, yeah. in, that, in that case, um, w would you, so an annual of average of enrollment mm -hmm. adjustment wouldn't, would, would under, might under, under fund. I mean, yeah. what we yeah. basically, as, as an agency, for us, best practice would be just license the whole school so we can have flexibility of space. If the school is willing to share their gym with us, hey, more power to us. You know, we can use their gym. And schools are sometimes territorial, you know, and um, if they allow <laughs> us to use their full building, we're going to license their full building so our children are their children because they are their children too have access to all those spaces, but then the licensor just gives us the numbers, like, oh, this many kids fit here, so let's just give you the, mm -hmm. so you can merge. Right, so I, I guess I'm, what, I think we, maybe we could, maybe we could get a little focus group together mm -hmm. of school age programs that are in this situation, because mm -hmm. I think there's some, maybe there's some other, where some other enrollment as, assumption we would want to make about that program. So I'm assuming most of the time they're licensed for 75 or something like that, right. and they've got 25 kids. And so um, 
on a daily basis they've got 25 kids but for however many days a year and maybe on school vacations or something they've got yeah. 75 right or 300 or, <laughs> or 300 <laughs> yeah so maybe there's some other way for school age to think about a blended mm-hmm. enrollment yeah rate. Or, or based on staffing obviously mm-hmm. we have to have the staffing mm-hmm. for the amount of children so right. i don't know I, i'm thinking about possibilities mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think we can dig into the Mm -hmm. specifics and think about it. Mm -hmm. I've got two clarifying questions. So one is just on how you monitor or verify annual enrollment. Like, what does that look like? Is that all just self-report? So there are two pieces to the process. So there is the entry of information into the application, some of which is verified through LEAD some of which is self-report. I will just flag, I think one thing that we are looking very, very carefully at is the sort of possibility of reporting on individual children. It keeps coming up and there's a lot in the um, budget language for FY26 around serving low-income children, serving children with high, like special needs that like we could actually do more that's better targeted if we had better information on individual children. But we need, we need the IT systems and the processes behind that. Um, but we do also have a very small but mighty team that is conducting ongoing audits as well. So we expect that programs are ver- the programs all verify as part of the application process that the information is accurate and that we expect record keeping. And so there is a background in the background a process of, of periodically double checking. Gotcha. That, okay. Okay. That sounds yeah. cumbersome. Well, we'll primarily rely on self-report mm-hmm. and then verification of self-report. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But and it's a shift because it was monthly. Yep. And, you know, we were adjusting grant payments on a monthly basis, but now it'll be October enrollment or this yeah, There's still monthly enrollment reporting to yes. get the annual average that's accurate, but. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. helpful. But I, I do think it's a very important point in the long term. We would really love, you know, it would be important to move to a place where all of this is systematized and verified as much as possible externally. Yeah. That also, I, would we be using annual enrollment from the past year for this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it would have been what they reported over the last year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then we need to, predict to continue the, to report. Yeah. Okay. So um, and then the second clarifying question is just, um, do you have mode counts for uh, FCC assistance like across the board? Like what's the mode of how many assistance FCC's tend we to do have. have that information. Do you have that I'm information? Not sure I don't have it at my fingertips, <laughs> but we ask each family child care provider each month, do you want to employ an assistant and how many hours mm-hmm. um, they mm-hmm. work? Um, and we use the, those hours to identify full time and part time. Gotcha. Um, so I don't have the data at my fingertips, but we do have that. Okay, that that's, have, that's helpful look because into the I think about, and this may be anecdotally, like I think about. Uh, FCCs who employ a few full-time folks and like how does that factor into this Mm -hmm. especially when we're thinking about a workforce that we want to grow and generate and we don't actually want to stop people from this Mm -hmm. is a good like assistants are a really good entry point into the workforce and Mm so if if there's an FCC who could benefit from having two full-time assistants are they disincentivized from that with this formula, question mark, I'm not sure. Yeah. But I, I think it really depends on what the modes look like yeah. um, and, and whether that's an outlier case or if that uh, fact, it actually is a more salient factor across the Commonwealth. Yeah, no, I know that that does exist. I've also heard from FCCs that do employ multiple assistants. Um, we can look at the frequency of that, but I will say I think the other thing that is coming, I mean, so much of this is dependent on our IT systems, but the other development work that is coming down the road is developing an educator portal, which we'll talk to you about as another time, um, but would also ultimately allow us to have a, a different process to verify and understand staffing. Um, because individual educators could be connected to the programs that they work with in our system so that it's no longer a self-report process um, cool. down the road. So I'm excited more on to that learn when about the nerd systems in the future. Yeah. <laughs> You have a lot of nerd company, just for the record. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm loving this meeting right now. Present, present company included. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we mentioned that there is a requirement that there, that we put a 1% cap on for-profit um, entities running more than 10 sites in Massachusetts. We are still, and this is something for FY25, but it also, in the budget language, continues on in, 
into FY26 and beyond. We are in the process of determining the best way to do it and looking at the impact that this will have on the field. Um, in LEAD, which is our licensing data system, we do have um, umbrella organizations as part of the system. So those are entities that run multiple sites. So we can look to see how many for-profit umbrella organizations are out there and how many sites do they have. And we've identified seven that would be affected by this cap. Um, and we are reviewing those organizations, the impact that this, this will have, and we'll, we'll absolutely reach out to each potentially affected organization as we go through the process of determining how to handle this. Um, the only other thing I will call out that I think is just important to understand, um, we also have a number of franchises operating in Massachusetts. The franchises function and lead as independent organizations. Um, they do pay royalties to, I believe it's called a franchisor for the, the, the licensing rights. Um, but they are not operated by those organizations, and so that's reflected in our structure. And over the last three years, we've developed a system whereby um, C3 money just does not, is not part of the calculation of the royalties that they paid, which is it's effectively based on revenue, so that if they don't count the C3 revenue as part of the revenue that they calculate royalties on, um, that money stays at the program site. So the, we are not looking at franchises as part of this analysis. I think it's just important to be clear about that. So again, that's how we come down to seven umbrella organizations. And again, we will work individually with those and determine how best to proceed on that front. Yeah, can I, I'm just curious of those seven, um, you know, what is there as you evaluate this? Um, I would imagine some of them take vouchers, mm -hmm. yep. right? So is there a fear of disincentivizing that? Like, well, is there any concern? Like, that's part of what we're looking at. And I mean, one thing that has been um, a nice change that we've seen over recent years is a growth in the number of vouchers that some of these entities are accepting. So that is something that we do want to continue to incentivize. Um, so it is balancing the legislative intent, but also using the commissioner's prerogative to think about you know, if there are exceptions to that. Some of these programs, of the, of the seven for-profit umbrellas, many of their sites are actually at 25% mm -hmm. and above mm -hmm. child care financial assistance. And many of the other ones um, have started signing voucher agreements and serving um, children with child care financial assistance. And I Which would we want to see. Of course. Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. We attribute that in a lot of ways to C3 and to the incentive that's clearly yeah. been, and also to the staff pilot where we were providing yeah. child care financial assistance for staff working in early education care programs. And you could only receive that for your staff if you had a voucher agreement, which opened it up for other other kids too. So seeing a lot of the changes we wanted to see as a, as a result of those two things. And you know, it's important to note how many children are, are served at these um, through these large um, entities um, and and that and and why the one percent cap kicks in is because the, of the large number of families that are choosing to to be served at these sites. So, I think we're we're worried about affecting capacity. <laughs> um, you know, we're we're worried about um, changing the incentives mm -hmm. that have obviously been been created, and we don't want to limit parent choice. If if this is a choice that a family is making, then of course we want to support that, and that goes to sort of our our value around universality uh, for the C three program as well. Um, so, thinking closely um, about how to implement this one percent to ensure that we're in compliance with um, legislative requirements and the spirit of the, uh, the spirit and word of the law, um, while, while also making sure that we're not disrupting um, any of those other sort of key strategies we want to make sure we keep in place. So it's one of the needles. <laughs> seeing through it. So this slide is a summary of um, the adjustments that we are proposing for FY25. Um, I just will, I'll run through these quickly just to make sure I've touched on all of them, but I believe we have. We've talked about the change in the funding formula to um, be more aligned with our cost models, um, adjusting the per slot payments around an average um, annual enrollment, replacing the social vulnerability index with the child opportunity index. Um, we are making, we, we are continuing the CEO compensation ratio that Adrian talked about. There is a slight adjustment. It's currently set at 40 to 1. We just bring it down to 30 to 1, which we found is, is the, um, looking at the data, the, the benchmark that really captures the end of the distribution that stands out from the, yeah. the rest of the distribution. Um, 
we are looking into the 1% funding caps for large for-profit providers. We will, again, be setting consistent monthly C3 payments. So it's the funding formula will set the payment once, and then that will be the payment, the monthly payment that programs receive for the rest of the year. Um, we have already instituted and will continue a pro process whereby new newly licensed providers have an opportunity every quarter to enter into C3, so you don't automatically join C3. Um, and we have, to date, been providing that opportunity on a quarterly basis to new providers, but it does also provide us with the opportunity to just, you know, every quarter take stock of where we are with spending and make sure that we are able to accommodate the growth that we're seeing in the field. Um, and I just we, want to pause on that one for mm -hmm. a second. So it, this is a great example of the transition from sort of COVID era stabilization to operational, ongoing operational support. So in, in COVID, we were just trying to keep programs open. And then as we were sort of coming out of COVID, it was open a program, you're going to get a C3 grant, we're going to help you open, we're going to give you support to do that, you know, and it worked, right? Our capacity has returned, it's exceeded by 7,100 seats or can't or never get the provide 10,000 seats and 7,100 <laughs> providers or the other way around. Um, and, and so it, when we had to implement budget adjustments in the end of the year, we had to sort of close it for new programs and that was not consistent with what we really mm -hmm. wanted to be able to do, which was to continue incentivize new programs to open. So um, part of setting sort of stable and predictable amounts of funding allows us to know how much funding we would have to, to have new pro to, to be able to get let new programs come into it. So they're sort of interrelated. And we think it's really important that new programs have access to C3, not waiting a whole year for that to happen. Um, and then one other um, administrative change that is, is already in place. Um, programs now need to recertify to get monthly payments on a quarterly basis. It used to be you could wait until the end of the fiscal year and then come in in the summer for 12 months worth of payments, um, and that obviously caused some challenges around predictability as well for us. So every quarter, all of the recertifications do need to be submitted, and that will continue. Um, and I will also add we are continuing the monthly recertification process. Um, for a number of reasons, even though the, the payment that is, is in place each month will remain yeah, I mean, Let me just say, we, you don't have, you, the programs will continue to be able to certify and get paid monthly. Yes. What, what we want to make sure is that it doesn't go any more than one quarter without a program coming in and certifying. So in, in we, we had one year where, you know, people didn't certify for the whole year and then came, and we just assumed they weren't participating in the program. And then, you know, according to the program rules, they were still eligible and recertifying at the end of the year. And that also creates a budget, you know, not, not enough knowledge for us about the budget needs. So. I'll also add we are looking to try to streamline the monthly data collection as much as possible. Yes. Um, there is important additional information we will need as part of this transition, but we're, th we're really thinking about, um, again, what is critical that we do collect on a monthly basis, what do we not need to collect every month, but just periodically to, um, to continue to track some other yep. um, metrics. So um, that's on our mind um, also to try to re reduce the burden. Um, that we know exists for programs. Yeah, the baseline is the programs are saying, yes, we are still open, we are still meeting all the eligibility requirements, um, and we also do need the enrollment information to calculate the average annual enrollment. Um, so this is the last slide, this is our timeline. Um, we are now in September and we are working with you and with many others around finalizing the formula. Um, in response to the budget language. We are currently continuing the payments that programs have been receiving based on the, the funding tiers that we started in May and June of this past fiscal year. Um, and as I mentioned, throughout and going forward, we will continue a quarterly process of admitting new programs. That will not change. In October, um, there, it, it's going to be a bit of a, a combination month. So we will continue to use the, the May and June funding tiers. The payments will not change in October, but we are going to add some questions to the application that are the questions that are, will be required for the new funding formula. And we will provide every program when they recertify information about how does that, how, how are the inputs, and what do the inputs in, into the new formula look like and what is the expected, um, expected payment so that people can start to understand 
how the, the formula works, and we get some basic information before we launch the new formula on where programs are on those characteristics. And then in November, we will launch the newly revised application and the new formula and set that, the payments at that point for the rest of the fiscal year while continuing the monthly recertification process, as Amy said, in a, as streamlined a way as possible. Um, we do have information on our website, and we are planning some uh, additional outreach and listening sessions as well, as the commissioner mentioned. And I believe those dates are posted at this point. Yes, they are posted. Um, Any okay. questions? So I very much support the CEO compensation adjustment. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, it, is there anyone in that category who would otherwise be in tier one or tier two? Yes. Um, I have a number cheat sheet. That number is not on my on my cheat sheet today, but I can. There are and there least, are programs. It's at least one. Yeah, but there maybe are more. Yeah, there are programs that that do serve as the commissioner said, a number of ch children receiving childcare financial assistance but exceed the CEO compensation ratio and therefore they are in tier three when they would otherwise have been in tier one or tier two. So despite being in tier one or tier two, they would not get any equity Correct. adjustment. They because would not be eligible for the equity adjustment. And that's, okay. as I think yeah. Justin said, that's similar to, to what we do in the under the current formula. We have a, there's a, a different threshold, but we, currently providers that exceed the CEO compensation it, ratio are not eligible. It actually is more strict currently. Yeah. They don't get either the staffing adjustment or the equity adjustment. We are actually integrating the staffing adjustment into the base rate, so this is a, a, a change. Great. Yeah. And it is at, the, I actually should call out, it is at the site level because yeah. it's related to the lowest paid um, educator. Uh, and that does actually sometimes affect things. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Out of curiosity, how how do you determine the formula for those for the new programs that are just entering the C three system? Like, how, you don't so they would submit when they first enter. They would submit the full application that would provide all the information that we so need. So it'd be current license, not or current enrollment, not really a correct. Oh yeah, it would yeah. Be we the, won't have a twelve month look back period for right. new programs, but then they'll continue to submit their enrollment over the course of that year. So. For the, the next year, we'll have the 12-year look-back period. I wonder 12 months look-back yeah. period Which, for those programs. I mean, I will just say the yeah. obvious conclusion from that is that there might be a strategy, like there might be a decision that a program wants to make about sort of what, at what point do you start applying for C3 when you open. Yeah. I'm just trying to look for yeah. openings for <laughs> adjustments for school age as well in terms of like, well, maybe we start, I don't know, we, yeah. we'll have to, I like the idea of like convening a few of those programs mm -hmm. impacted. Yeah. I'm putting in this in, in the category of going deeper. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and living within, you know, again, we've talked about the budget and the framework that that is for us and trying to figure out how to live within that. And so I um, appreciate the ability to follow this, this work, especially as we build towards the board playing uh, a more robust role and any future formula changes. Um, it's really helpful to follow along this process with you guys. And I will say on that point too, our goal here is to put something in place that is durable. And while there will be ongoing tweaks and edits over time that we will bring to you, um, it would be wonderful if we're not doing a full revamp of the formula every year. I think that that's destabilizing and challenging for everybody unless there's a reason for it. Yeah, I mean, thinking about predictability and just mm -hmm. trying to, you know, again, we, we're in learning mode with this program, especially as a as those levers for incentives have worked, like all the things are working and you know, obviously I had to make some adjustments towards the end of last year and how do, we, how do we get a formula that has a little bit of staying power just to allow providers to plan accordingly uh, with what their allocation is. Yeah. I mean, we recognize, you know, I think the, the signal from the legislature and the governor of making this program permanent and funding it fully with state dollars at 475, um, is is a really important signal to the commitment and mm. permanence of this program and and further changes i think continue to contribute to anxiety about is it going to be here at what level will it be here can i fund staff salaries with this because is it going to be at the level i expect so i think we hope we'll be a year from now in a different place where programs can feel more um confident about how they can use the funds and what the what they can what they can expect to receive so we're on that path but i don't think it's going to happen 
we recognize that I think it's still going to be a year of, of, of change and worry in some ways for programs yeah. as well. Any other comments, questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to thank everybody for, for being here today. And um, I think as you can tell from today's presentation, uh, we're launching a, a new fiscal year. Uh, and, and there's a lot of work in this movement right now. Uh, and grateful to have the partnership of this board and the team and Commissioner, your leadership, and Mr. Secretary, your team, and the administration's leadership as we, as we do go deeper into a lot of this work to ensure that we are um, fulfilling the Commonwealth's role to, to really provide quality access and affordable uh, early education care to our most vulnerable in this uh, in this community and across the Commonwealth. So thank you guys. Uh, with that, I'd make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Can I have a second? Second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. We'll see you in October. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.